Hi, everybody. I didn't realize I was muted. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Rookie mistake. If you feel like saying hello, um, please feel free to pipe up in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. One advantage of virtual events is to see how far and wide our audiences come from. It's really great to have you all here. Okay. All right, well, I wanna take as little... Hi, Marina, tuning in from Syracuse. Thank you for letting us know. Um, if anybody else wants to let us know where they're tuning in from, that would be great. And make sure to check out Cynthia's book, the featured book tonight. I just posted the link in the chat. And um, I'll just get started with our intro so as not to waste any time. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. This is our third of the year. Um, I'm Jean from Greenlight Bookstore and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Cynthia Dewi-Oka launching her new book, Fire Is Not A Country. She'll be talking with Jenny Zhang, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say huge thanks to Cynthia, to Jenny, and to the team at Triquarterly Press for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up tonight. Although we're not able to host events in our store spaces quite yet, our community of authors and readers is still here, and we're really grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection around books. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by looking on the clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat, which is a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with your fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by either of the presenters tonight, please post that question in the Q&A module, which looks like two speech balloons. And most importantly, tonight's featured book, Fire is Not a Country, is available for sale from Greenlight. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Cynthia's book and so many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US, and I'll drop the buy link in the chat. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we're also offering 10% off of the featured book if you enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of indie bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a really great way to show your support. Um, now about our speakers tonight, our interviewer is Jenny Zhang, author of the story collection Sour Heart and the poetry collection My Baby First Birthday. Jenny will be reading and then she'll be speaking with our featured author Cynthia Dewi Oka. Oka is the author of Salvage Poems and, the, and Nomad of Salt and Hard Water. Originally from Bali, Indonesia, she has most recently been awarded the Leeway Foundation's Transformation Award, the Tupelo Quarterly Poetry Prize, and an Amy Clampett Residency. She lives with her son and partner in New Jersey. In her new book, Fire is Not a Country, Oka dives into the implications of being parents, children, workers, and unwanted human beings under the savage reign of global capitalism and resurgent nativism. With a voice bound and wrestled apart by multiple histories, fire is not a country, claims the spaces between here and there, then and now, us and not us. So Cynthia and Jenny are gonna start us off with readings from their books, and then they'll be talking with each other and with all of you. Without further ado, please take it away, Jenny and Cynthia. Oh, I, I was also muted. <laughs> It's like taking, um, I guess, uh, a lot of us, including me, a second to get back to doing Zoom stuff after the brief feeling of being with people in person. Um, anyway, I'm really excited um, to celebrate Cynthia and Fires on a Country. And uh, it feels like a very cozy night with all of you, even though I can't see any of you. But, um, and, 
you know, maybe some of you guys are in non-cozy situations, but it, it, it feels really nice and um, I'm gonna take it in. I'm gonna just read two poems and then um, you guys will get to hear from Cynthia and then we'll talk and um, feel free to put your thoughts in the chat at any point or put a question in the Q and A. Um, I'm gonna read um, an older poem. It's from uh, my book, My Baby First Birthday. And um, uh, the book is, is um, organized into four seasons. And uh, since we are in the middle of winter, I thought I would read the last poem from uh, winter because um, I'm always looking forward. This is called Goo Goo Water. On my baby first birthday, I drank Goo Goo Water. My parents ate Mongolian beef. I had chicken with broccoli. My little brother had nine more years to be born. In those nine years, he swam in egg drop soup and went goo goo to the whales who were goo goo to the krill who were goo goo to the sea urchins who were goo goo to the goo that live underwater like me. Like me, they don't swim. Like me, they don't swallow semen. If semen gets stuck in their mouths, they just goo goo it onto another sick fuck, which is not as sad as not being who you say you are, which is not as sad as not being who you want to be, which is not as sad as not being who you could be, which is not as sad as not being who you should have been. I should have been born with big fat cunt lips for lips. I should have been born with the skinny regular cunt for a cunt. Had I been, then my little cunt could have given farewell speeches at the end of great moments like this moment. When my mother said she was glad she gave birth to me and I said I was too and she knelt down by my cunt lips and kissed the very mouth that said what had to be said. Um, okay. It really is uh, hard to get used to doing Zoom again. Um, all right, I'm gonna read um, I don't know if I don't know. I want to either read a poem about my cat or a poem um, that is a tribute to a Frank Ocean song. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, I can't do both. Um, I, I will, you know, I'll read a poem for my cat because, um, I don't know, these are hard times <laughs> and, um, cats are wonderful mystic beings. Um, Maybe it'll be fun also to see um, the, 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 the journey from how I used to write to how I write now, because this is actually the most, um, the newest poem that I've written. Um, it's the most recent poem I've written. It is called, um, My Sweet Angel on Earth, Thank You for This Life. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, not trying to be subtle. The idea of my current life began one solar revolution ago. To think I almost missed this, called the hotline numbers, dropped the mask, old friends who still pick up on the first ring. It was hard to get up. Mostly I crawled like a crushed bug. If I lived, it was only partly will and partly divine. That afternoon, I walked out into the sun, one foot in front of the other. I wasn't trying to step in front of the bus, but neither could I bring myself to look both ways. It is a miracle some people can't, and other people also can't, but their body stays intact, sinking through the floorboards, down through the basement, 
and the sub basement and the sub sub basement and the sub 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 sub. There's no more earth to dig up. The fire holds over the lake and the air is still when rain ripples through the cracked soil. Sonia found your mom on the roof. What creature doesn't want to be fed? What creature doesn't care to be held? What callousness have we enacted to make earthly creatures so fearful? When you were born, I was terribly alone. It crossed my mind, nothing would ever change. I looked for the fates and the furies, the generational curses and the inauspicious beginnings where it was written in the stars. At the very least, I would have liked to blame God. I didn't know what it was like to feel another heartbeat. When you show me your belly, I remember all the times I tried and couldn't. Every single instance, <laughs> it's an emergency out there. Every single instance I chose the wrong time, the wrong place, the wrong person to be soft with. We make shapes all through the night. I love it when you perch on me. We hold each other and it's not about being a container for pain or healing the birth wound. It is really not about saving the world anymore. I feel humble because of you and I know gratitude too. We spoon through all the phases of the moon and sunbathe in the mornings. I finally know what this feeling is like. I want to explain, but I honestly can't. To make the words as much or more than the actual experience would be impossible, maybe even wrong. Your love is the sweetest love. It is a miracle for I still feel sorrow. I still cry for days. The pain is still very much here. But now that this is more than an idea, I have began, I have begun to learn to make myself happy. Waiting for things to change seems silly now. Every day you know more of the world. I'm your mom and you are my baby and we have a beautiful life together. All right, thanks guys. Um, Please, uh, I guess, give it up silently or loudly in your own homes for Cynthia Dewioka. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Thank you, Greenlight. Thank you, Jean, um, for, for making this happen. Thank you so much, Jenny. I was so mesmerized um, by the poems and... Um, Having met Terry and gone to spend some time with her, it was like really lovely to hear that tribute because I totally, um, there's just like this moment I feel like uh, right now with the pandemic where we're being invited, I guess, to be in our most tender versions with each other. And I think there are like parts of me that really struggle with that, that like once that like resists it. Um, and it's such a gift um, to hear your work and um, feel that invitation all over again and feel more capable of doing that. So just thank you. Um, I am just going to read actually one poem from my book, Fire is Not a Country, but it is a longer poem. And in sort of this, in the spirit of vulnerability and tenderness, um, it was funny, I was thinking about this poem, I hadn't read it for any of my launch events up until now, um, because I don't know, I just kind of feel soft about it. And I was thinking about it for tonight's event. And then I asked Jenny if she had any requests. <laughs> and I hadn't told her that this was the poem that I was thinking about. And this is, it was the same poem that she, um, she named. So um, it just goes to show that friendship goes a long way um, in, our, in our literary and hopefully also in our personal lives. So I'm just gonna read this poem and it's called, Because I Miss Her. And um, it's for my mother who I miss.
because I miss her, stay with me. Though you are an ear I've invented from saltless air that cracks my skin, though I leave you. Facing you like this in complete darkness, the small hairs on the back of my neck stand up, treading like seaweed, the heft of the Pacific. I have been reading Ross Gay's catalog of unabashed gratitude over and over on the train from Camden to Philly and mornings when the light is blue and gold over the Ben Franklin, like waves breaking over my head. Those days I swam until I couldn't hear my mother's warnings of the riptide and violins in the corals. To catch a glimpse of the dolphins at play, I thought to be unable to distinguish between body and sky, beauty and fear must be a kind of fortune. I have just begun to love the little knives of which I made for their portable alien music. Strung by their hilts in the wind, they make a dissonance more honest than the half remembered melodies I play on the piano to please my father's shadow standing arms crossed in the doorway. I can't explain how it came to be that when something I promised to care for sickens, I move not to heal, but to cut it away. And this makes me question if it is time to lay the knives down here on the kitchen counter where the blue and gold light springing through the window leaping off their steel would fill my eyes too slow to blink with fast dissolving suns. And if it is time also to turn my face toward the source of that light, hidden now behind the roof of the train at rest in the station and the ironwork of branches that have borne themselves through another indifferent winter. Though I do not feel its warmth yet, though its generosity is abstract to a person like me, who does my duty behind walls and cannot manage to keep even the philodendron with its green abundance of hearts alive. Forgive me, philodendron. I have known only how to want certain ideas of you, lush, unselfish, obedient in the corner of the room, the way I am begotten of those ideas too. Sometimes I dream I am running on a rainforest soundproof floor through thickets of carnivorous flowers shot through by spears of light lean and long as my sun who when I awaken is there beside me, blowing his horn, somehow thriving in the undergrowth while his mother runs from one Pacific poised like a machete against the whole green world to another. Forgive me machete for reminding you what you have been, for choosing saprophytes, limning the black soil. Last night, the neighborhood lights went out and no one thought it was worth knocking on anyone else's door to find out what happened. If just for the communion of it, the brief candle of shared bafflement, which could have with some hyperbole maybe flowered into a carnivorous kind of laughter because something had been lost to all of us that meant something however minor and transient in this part of the world. I sat right here, like a train stopped between destinations or the part of the beach that by 6 p.m. would be underwater, welcoming the going away of definitions for my immediate future, while my iPhone winked at distant lights, risking collisions, unauthorized additions, myths and reinterpretations like immigrants. That was how I thought of my mother 
shouting from the shore as distant light in her duster and the makeshift horn of her hands. Did you know that before a dolphin calf is born, its mother would sing to it so that once it separates from her flesh, it would know how to come back. Each dolphin has a signature whistle like no other. And that is what the decades of censorship took from us. Our mother singular whistlings, a way to let ourselves be lost at sea for a while where the lights do not reach because I'd know how to call her, specifically her back to me and not the whip of my father or lovers built of the bubbling inside a mountain or America, which would have me dream it and nothing else. My mother shining like a paranoia of nights without electricity and love, which all these years kept me fastened to myself, sharpening my knives. She would have wanted me to ask nicely to volunteer my life for an idea of my life because she knows what it is to send a voice out over the water and have nothing come back. I am both the warning and the letting all of it happen. Look how the tide eats the darkness. The train breaks away like a chunk of coral. I am waiting for the shout of light like blood in the water. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> How are you doing, Cynthia? I'm good. It's so good to see you. Amazing to see you. I get, I get emotional now at everything, um, but I feel happy to be in these little squares with you. Okay. Um, I have to ask you the hardest question in the world, which is so unfair, but, <laughs> but because you read this um, wonderful poem, because I miss her, I have to ask you this question, which is um, how do we begin to love the little knives of which we are made of? And you don't have to have the answer to that, but I'm wondering. Yeah. The people that's such to. a good question um i and i think you know i i also want to hear um what you think about that because um i think there's something about the reflective surfaces of the knives um that i was thinking about um because i think and I don't, I don't, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but I grew up in a culture, in a country, in a family where um, I was loaded from very early on with notions of who I was supposed to be. Sometimes these things were contradictory and they were very loud. Like it, it, it's like, you know, waking up every day with to like a cacophony in your head about who you are supposed to be. And, um, and it made as though I was like, uh, like as though I was an empty room or a reflective surface for all of these projections of what people wanted. You know, you have to be like the perfect child or like the um, best daughter and the most obedient and whatever the yeah. top class or like whatever whatever and then later it becomes like you know submissive woman and machine worker who like never stops like and I think that um I began to love the knives because they were like slivers I felt them like cuts you know like it, it's almost like cuts inside me that then turned sharp themselves and became um the beginnings of like where I could glimpse the person that I could be that I wanted to be and it's like I feels like it feels like they're um 
it, it feels like glimpses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Um, and then I think sometimes they knock together and make their own music. And I think that sometimes we get told, like when the music of those knives come out, we are told that we are being um, bad, aggressive, evil women um, because we are not behaving the way we should or we are not speaking um, in the ways that please everybody. Um, mm -hmm. But I also felt like often they were um, the truest things that I had to say, even if they were like the most, even if they were imperfect, mm. if that makes sense. So I think it's both just like the fact that they, you know, kind of operated like little mirrors and even the fact that they cut me, I think, you know, I think a lot about this. Like, I feel like we live in a world that gaslights us so much about how okay we are supposed to be with everything. Yeah. And I think they remind me that that's not true. They remind me that I am injured by the world and that is valid and um, that nobody gets to tell me that these things didn't happen. Even, you know, they can tell themselves that these things didn't happen, but the, the little knives are like my version of events. Mm -hmm. So, totally yeah, what do you think? It, it, what you're saying and um, that line in your poem, it makes me think of um, the Little Mermaid. <laughs> do you remember the Hans mm -hmm. Christian? Little Mermaid. Um, I, I'm sure everyone here, many of you know, um, but you know, there's the Disney version and then there's the one that um, was written hundreds of years before that. And I always liked in the Hans Christian Andersen version, how basically like the, it's like this thing where mermaids live like 400 to 500 years and then they become sea foam and uh, every mermaid girl when they become of age they get to go one day into the human world and kind of it's just like kind of metaphorical thing of like getting older means getting to see what else is out there and what you can't have so that your life is somehow both more painful and meaningful or wow. something like, like the bliss is not real until you see what you can never have so like all the little mermaids get to go up and see the world but all of them are like oh I like it's so much better down here like this, this the sea under the sea is the best we don't care for like those ugly humans except for the little mermaid who goes, who her whole life has wanted to be part of the human world. Um, and she like goes and sees this shipwreck and then this prince on the ship that she falls in love with, you know, falls into the ocean. She drags him out into shore and saves him. Um, and it's like a whole the thing, but she has to leave by sun up. So he never knows that it's her. But anyway, long lead up to what you were saying, which is that, um, she goes to the witch and she's like, I'll give you my beautiful singing voice if you can cut up my fins and give me legs, right? And I always loved that in that version, the whole time she's human, every time she walks, she feels these sharp knives cutting into the stumps mm -hmm. of like, her legs. And so every step is like physically painful mm -hmm. because I was always looking for as a child, like physical expressions of invisible like pain right. and um this is like a long digression but when I was um really little I broke a mirror and I, I put my I kind of rubbed my hand over the mirror and the shard went into my finger right here mm. and it never it like didn't come out for years it was just like stuck in there and I would try every single day to get it out but there was like this other part of me that liked it because every time I played the piano when I had to practice every day, I'd feel the pain. And I knew it was like a legitimate pain because I could see the glass shard. Whereas I, I couldn't be sure if everything else, it just wasn't tangible. It wasn't like physical. Yeah. So I kind of just wanted to bring that up because I liked the way that you made um, things so tangible. Um, in, in that poem and in your book and in, in that line. But also, uh, I don't really know the answer to my own question. I, I, this is like my lifelong question of like, um, how do we, 
accept and love the fact that like after a certain point on earth, people are walking around maimed and wounded and that's just the state of things. And it's not a depressing thing or a sobering thing or a shocking thing. Like that's just like having a body for a while, right? And we have to find a way to love that anyway. It, it's, I don't know, I, I don't, I really don't know the answer. I just, uh, I put the question out for everyone. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, I think, I love that you shared this backstory about Little Mermaid because this is like super recently, I went to like, I spent a day at Mass Mocha and there was this artist, I cannot remember her name, I'm terrible. But um, she had done like, like a video installation of the Little Mermaid where she rewrites. It's almost like, so there's like the dialogue that they say, and then she like sidebars it. So there's like a ton of like these sidebars, like actual interior dialogues that's like happening that she reimagines. And um, it's really funny, um, really smart. But then it was like the first time that I realized that the Little Mermaid, like, I mean, the Disney version, but also it sounds um, true in this part anyway, to the um, original Hans Christian Andersen version um, of it as an immigrant story, because you actually like trade being in a new land with your voice. Mm. You know, like with your, like you end up being silent in a way. And um, I also kind of like, and this sits with me in terms of like, I, I actually kind of detest the trope of immigrants are as silent because I grew up in immigrant communities and I'm just like, they're really not. It's, it's like the loudest. I'm like, my aunties are very loud. Um, but what it is, is about sort of like, the voice that you do have the world around you suddenly can't hear. Um, and that is like a form of silence that I think we don't, like it feels like the onus is always on the silenced to speak as opposed to like the people who are not listening to actually listen. Um, and I think that's also like connected to what you were saying about like these how do you, there's like the part of us that like needs to, that that very, um, it's like a really visceral reaction, like as a kid to like be able to see the cut and feel the pain to like know that the thing is real, right? Like the pain is real, like you were saying. And then how do you ask for help? Or like, how do you communicate it to somebody? And I think about like the ways that like, um, yeah, like gender, migration, class, like all of these things kind of like they sit on top of each other where it's like, even if we know it's real um, for ourselves, there's like all of these ways that we can't make it real for others. Or yeah. Like it's really difficult to make it real for others because it feels like you're like talking in a soundproof room. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I, right. Yeah. No, you're right. I can't, it, it really is an immigrant parable because also the thing about um, immigration and migration is other people are not curious about you and people, I just always remember how in both the Disney version and the Hans Christian Andersen, the prince thinks the little mermaid is just this cute little like deaf and dumb mute. Yeah. And it's just a little child. And the, and you've talked about this a lot the ways in which we like infantilize, especially like immigrant women and also men. And um, and I, I just remember uh, at my, my book, my first ever big book launch, um, there was, uh, uh, I can't get into the details. I, I'm gonna get into some of the details, but I can't get into all the details, but basically it was a book launch where literally none of my friends or family could go because it got sold out within like one second. And so like literally no one was like really, like there for me, but it was like all white people, except for my parents, who I had managed to get comp tickets for. And I just remember like all these, them in. <laughs> yeah, I had to like beg for my own parents to come to my event. But um, all these people, all these white women kept coming up to me and be like, are those your parents? They're so cute. And, you know, they said that because they were the oh. only Asian people in the whole bookstore. But right. I also was like, 
yeah, they are cute, but they're also not cute in the way you think they're cute. Right. Like you, you just say the word cute because to, to you, they're like personality list, little like people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what I thought of when you were talking about um, the little mermaid. I was also wondering, um, here's another kind of like big question because I always wonder about titles and I feel like Fire is Not the Country is such an evocative title. And I guess I'm curious, like what is fire to you and what is a country <laughs> to you? <laughs> These are such big questions. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny Zay. Uh, <laughs> good God. Let me be uh, like, yeah. yeah. You know, I think fire is like, I, I was like having this conversation like with the, with the Rumpus book club um, because the, um, their coordinator, uh, Brian Spears, um, he grew up like, uh, you know, he grew up in Jehovah's Witnesses. And so he was like talking about like what fire meant in that tradition as um, sort of like this purifying force that you know kind of makes the world a higher version of itself um and how uh and you know like he, he he's speaking about it like in a, in a way that that I think was like critical um because we don't necessarily think about like the cost you know of well who gets burnt though <laughs> like when you want to purify the world um, and I, you know, I, I come from a country with like a profoundly violent history. Um, Indonesia was colonized for like 350 years by like the Dutch. Um, they were terrible. And then also for like four years during World War II by the Japanese. And then um, Shortly after independence, like not too long after, they also like, you know, people in my country also murdered each other. Um, and it was in the US was like a part of that because um, they wanted to wipe out communism in Indonesia and like support that. So like there is a way in which there's like a historical kind of memory of like fire being something that is used to control, divide, um, exterminate um historically like elements that are not wanted right and um my family being like Chinese Indonesians like they carry their like my mom has definitely like she has so much trauma from growing up as a Chinese person in Indonesia she was born there and was like classified a foreigner all her life and so like she married my dad and then got like you know sponsored mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of like what that was like um and so I think there is this kind of like, and you know, it's the land of volcanoes. So there's also fire coming. There's like political fire. And then there's like geological fire also erupting yeah. everywhere. <laughs> um, and then you have, and then there is like religion is a mass. It's like a really, really um, powerful force in the country. And uh, my parents, were devout Christians and so like what Brian was saying also like I was I also feel very familiar with that growing up being like this is I, I remember my parents saying this like fire tempers you it's like the thing that makes you a better person it's the thing that cleanses away your sins and like burns mm -hmm. your flesh so that only the spirit remains Whoa. so yeah it's like a whole thing so it's like literally and it's weird because I feel like some of these um, spiritual traditions, I'm like, I'm like, there's like a really, I'm like, is it like a death wish? You know what I mean? Like ingrained inside of it because it's right. so anti-body. So right. I think that to me, it's like what, like because of all of these different vectors of like what, fi how fire has shaped um, my imagination, like that's how I think about it. It's like fire is something that is anti-body that is like mm. that attacks the flesh that mm -hmm. you know kind of releases you into like spirit form right. and I think to me like country is the body <laughs> so, right. like, so I think to me that is the tension that's like in the title is that um the thing that wants to cleanse you 
cannot be you. Right. That's wow. so that that's so interesting because also when you were talking, I was thinking about how like the most maybe this isn't common anymore and I'm dating um, how active I was on Instagram in 2015 or something like that. But uh, <laughs> you know, like when you do something really great or you brag on yourself or you post like, um, you know, like a, a thirst trap, people will put like fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji. Yeah. And I'm always just like, I don't know, like the way that we use it in like common vernacular or like if, if you are like really into someone, you're like, I burn for them. Right. But if if, uh -huh. if they're just like lukewarm to you, if you're like, oh, I have a, you know, reasonable, small simmering flame for them. Like no one's like, yeah, that's the guy for you. Like <laughs> right. you're supposed right. to burn for them. You're supposed to, um, you know, your loins are supposed to burn. Um and uh, what was the other thing? Oh, and also just, yeah. And I was just thinking about the first, um, you know, question uh, I was asking. And also I encourage anyone in the audience who has a question to please ask a question. You can ask it in the Q&A. You can also type in the chat. Um, we are very informal here, so you can do whatever you want. It's a cozy little night. But, you know, I was also just thinking when you were saying it's antithetical to the body, I was also thinking like country is a home and our bodies are one of, you know, right. the only homes that we have from the beginning of our lives in this form to the end. Um, and, you know, loving the body is a way of loving the knives in which we are made of. And, uh, and you know, like burning for someone and burning for something and, and, and something being fire. Is not quite the same thing as 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 love. I, I don't think all fire. I don't think you're saying this either. Is is this, I'm not saying it's all bad, but it it is kind of like an unsustainable thing, right? Which is why the idea of like infinite fire is so terrifying because no fire is supposed to last for like that long. <laughs> but so those were kind of all of the things uh, that I was thinking of when you were talking, Cynthia. Yeah, and actually what you just made me think of um, because of the fire, 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 fire. <laughs> <laughs> is also, I mean, like the language that we use, it's like, uh, we need to fuel up. Um, people get burned out. Yes. Right? Like literally, or, um, and yeah, I, 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 and I do think that um, like speaking as like a, like an Asian presenting person, like, in America and also like before in Canada as a kid like be like being called hot was like also it is fringed with danger right <laughs> it's like it's fringed with danger it's fringed with sort of like oh somebody wants to consume you and control you and like take you and it's not just like um I don't know it's not like fireworks you know what I mean, it's like, no, you're like a log that we want, we want to put in, in the fireplace. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I think there is something, and you know, I, I, and what's funny is like, so I had this like amazing tarot reading with our good friend, Ariana. Um, talk to you. Ariana, we are invoking your name tonight. Um, yes. Dream city tarot, everybody, like we totally recommend it. Um, but Ariana was like, you know, what I kept coming up like in this particular reading for me was once and once is like fire. That there's been a lot of it in like sort of my past and that's or also something sort of that um, that is my challenge in the present. And um, she said this thing that um, was so difficult and also beautiful for me to hear. Um, but she was like, you know, you get to have water too. Um, she's like, you also deserve water. And mm -hmm. um, what would it be like, you know, to kind of invite and to put yourself into spaces where what's flowing into you is water and what you're like activating. Like, it's not just like fiery electric energy all the time. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, I feel like in, in a way like that, poem that I just I read it's like that's like almost like my prayer to you know it's like it's for my mom it's thinking about my mom but it's like there's a reason that like 
that the kind of love that um I wish for her and I wish for myself is like associated with like the ocean even though the ocean is also like you know it is also a dangerous place it is also a place where loss happens and death happens um where there's like corals (laughs) that can fuck up your feet and your legs it's happened to me um but there's something about that energy that um water holds the body water Mm. doesn't turn it to dust does that Mm. make sense yeah that does make sense yeah you can also very easily get lost in the watery depths as I have (laughs) this is true (laughs) but there's pitfalls in in all of the elements uh (laughs) yeah um (laughs) you know I was um rereading your book last night um in the water in the bathtub Mm -hmm. and I I noticed that you had a lot of poems um, about fathering and being fathered and fathers. And I remember I was once uh, in the before times at this uh, literary festival uh, with this like very international group of writers. And um, as often happens in those situations, people go out for drinks like after the dinner and then you're kind of wandering this like foreign town with a bunch of also foreign people with you know no one has any connection to anything and you're just kind of prowling about and then a couple of like drunk sort of older men start pontificating on what literature is and isn't and and I get really annoyed and try to troll them um but I remember this one older uh gentleman um was like he was like in every story like uh I'm gonna say this right now like in every story every story is like looking for the father and I was like yeah I guess and Hmm. also also the Hmm. mother I I don't know like yeah that's true and I, I was thinking about that as I was reading your book um and I guess um another big question like what does what does it mean to be fathered and what does it mean to father someone wow i mean i would say what does it mean to be fathered like i do have a good ideal response to this which is the witcher season two (laughs) (laughs) i haven't seen Um, that yeah, so you know, Henry Cavill in like a, a long blonde wig being Gerald of Rivia <laughs> um, and having this adopted daughter because basically he had like, a, it was a promised child. It wasn't like his child, like he had helped this like royal couple or whatever. And then they had this baby and um, it was promised, the, the baby was promised to him. So like by the, by the time he came and got her, she was like a teenager. And she was like, you know, she had like secret powers, obviously, because this is the Witcher. Um, But the, I like couldn't stop watching this. Yes, Gerald plus Siri equals goals. Exactly. Um, Yes, it was such an incredible, it was such a healing tale to watch, um, Mm. to see this relationship unfold, um, his dedication to protecting her even when he kept failing Mm. and um because you know like who can actually like really protect anyone um on earth but then there's also the fact that um she had inadvertently used her powers in profoundly destructive ways because she know she she had had no one to sort of like guide her on how to use them Mm. and he wouldn't abandon her. He wouldn't condemn her. Mm. Like, like I am here and it is not perfect. And I want you to come home, you know? Um, and I just like watched that series and like bald my face a lot because I think that when I think about fathering, I think about um, effort like what's the what is the effort to um to protect to create a safe environment um to Mm -hmm. 
you know, to, to offer guidance. And I think that we also like, um, and, you know, when I say father, I feel like it's not even attached to gender because I was, um, as a single mom, like I had to do both, like, uh, father and and your mother. um, yes. And, um, and I almost think of like, you know, we have this, this story of like the, the father warrior. I'm like, I don't know. I feel like it's totally reversed for me. I'm just like, I feel like the moms are like the ones that go out there and like fight and like, um, make sure like, um, bills are paid <laughs> and, um, kids are taken care of. And I think about, um, the kind of fatherly principle is this kind of like effort to stay with your children, um, whatever they might go through. And mm-hmm. it is something I wish I had had, you know? So mm-hmm. I think I, I, I write, I write to my, I write often to my father, what, um, what I wish for us what Mm. the relationship is that I wish that we had had and to try to see sort of like the best in him he was a very difficult man um and you know for with with my own son I mean like his father like bounced his biological dad um didn't want to have any didn't want to have anything to do with us and sort of kind of disappeared from our lives Mm. and um and what happened was that like Paul grew up with like a fathering community with right. like, lots of like different people in his life who like step in and like offer that kind of like space of protection. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, what does it mean for you? Um, that's such a like the 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 fathering community. I, I really connect to mm-hmm. and. I, I was thinking about this question because I often think about, I, I, I often get hung up on like the idea of like mothering and mothering other people and mothering myself mm-hmm. and being mothered and um, like all the different forms of motherhood. And maybe that's kind of a more, uh, and maybe there's like a lot of pressure for people who identify as women to think about like mothering more sometimes than um, fathering, but uh you know, uh, speaking of tarot and uh, our sweet friend, Ariana Lenarski, I always had a very like um, intensely negative reaction whenever, for those of you guys who know tarot, whenever I would get like um, the kind of like king king cards, like right. the king of swords or like the king of, especially the king of swords and also a little bit like the king of, of wands, um, but also the emperor, like all of these sort of like father like figures um, really bothered me. And I have a Chinese tarot deck where one of the cards, which I think is like maybe like the Hierophant or something in the um, in the Rider Waif deck is like Confucius. And I'm like very triggered by Confucius <laughs> because of sort of um, the way in which like the like his teachings would like filter down and uh, into my experience, you know, by, uh, you know, like a parent telling me that like, no matter what my parents said to me and no matter how they treated me, I have to be grateful. And I just very like resented these kind of like great men and their authorities and their structures and their belief systems that they created that then impacted entire civilizations for generations and that, you know, were filtered down through the ancestors to make it so that I felt so trapped and, 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 and so um, I'm stuck. So I had a very sort of like a bad reaction to the idea like being fathered by someone, whether it was my own father or whether it was like, you know, a friend or an authority figure, anyone who was authoritarian, anyone who claimed the absolute rule of law, I was just so bothered by. I was like, how dare you absolutely claim any of this? Yeah. And then um, I think I came to understand that you know, it's like what you were saying about like too much fire. And then I was saying about too much water, like there, this is so sort of basic, but it's like, there has to be a balance, right? Like there has to be a structure for like, like for all 
the water, there has to be like a well structure for the water to be in. Otherwise it's just everywhere. <laughs> um, there has to be a container. There has to be um, something, uh, there has to be like solid ground to, you know, build the structures upon. And maybe that can be a way of thinking about the father that isn't so, you know, about inflicting punishment and more about like creating stability and structure. I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's like the father is like the ultimate symbol of all patriarchal fantasies right yeah like whether that be like the fantasy of the nation state or like the fantasy of the government or like the fantasy of like whatever it is um the fantasy of academia the fantasy of the family like head of the household the father blah 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 and like I and you know I mean there's been so much written about this like in feminist literature and like um women who like like have traced back and propose like alternate ways of reading how history evolved where at some point, like when we develop weapons and like whatever, like men decided that it was to their advantage um, symbolically, politically, legally and all of this stuff to associate the father with like this idea of like the origin and therefore they get to like say like, this is the foundation for all the things that are to, you know, ensue forth um whereas I think that there is but I feel like it's it's never total right like the tradition and it's tradition is never total like there's always like for whatever manages to become tradition there is like an undercurrent there is an alternate there's like an underground that happens and I think for me um the desire and sense of responsibility um to offer, to like, to do exactly, to do what Gerald said, you know, it's like this place is like imperfect. Um, well, like, you know, while his daughter is like wiling out and just like destroying things and he's like, come home. Like, and I will, I will, I will hold you like that kind, not like militarist protection but like almost like emotional protection if that makes sense um totally. yeah that is protection of the noblest order I it would is say protection of the noblest order so I think <laughs> that it and I feel like that is the thing that um I I desperately desperately wish for yeah i want it for you and i want it for everyone um we'll have we'll ask we'll answer this one question and then we'll um, send everyone off um back into their homes from where they already are cynthia and jenny what directions are you headed in on and or off the page from from here from green light bookstore um i can answer first and then maybe you can answer cynthia is that cool um what directions Am I headed in? Um, I'm gonna try to stay inside and like hibernate and rejuvenate a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't have big plans. I'm kind of just um you're you're looking at it. I'll be on this couch doing what I do every day, thinking, reading, and um, working and sleeping. How about you? Um, hibernating to the best of my ability, uh, for sure. Uh, I think, yeah, like I think thinking, reading, definitely also on the list. I have like this goal to like, I don't know, I made like a list of these hundred movies that like I wanna, I wanna watch this year <laughs> so oh, yeah um, yeah I think yeah I, I I think both on and off the page I just I want to move towards um I think I, I think we always try to tell the truth as poets as writers um and I think I I have done it for a long time with um with not love towards myself. Mm -hmm. So I want to see what happens when I write with that um, in this next stage. 
That sounds like a lovely thing to be doing in um, this hibernating season and extremely worthy and uh, very inspiring. And um, I'm gonna try to do the same. You've inspired me, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Cynthia, for sharing your work and letting me share a little bit of mine too tonight. Of course, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you both so much. That was such a great conversation. It's sad to curtail it here, but um, thank you everyone for showing up tonight. Um, make sure to get your copy of Fire is Not a Country from Greenlight and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Cynthia, Jenny. Take good care. Happy hibernating. Bye everyone.